the time. Hello, good um, good day, good morning. It's a small uh, group today, uh, but I understand we have uh, 15,000 people watching it online, so let's do it anyway. Uh, this is going out live, um, which is obviously part of presentations these, day, these days. And um, we have uh, um, had a session yesterday on hybrid meetings and uh, uh, remote participants from uh, different angles. We were looking at it. Um, I'm just going to introduce this session today, which is on presentation techniques. And it is uh, a real pleasure to announce the people that are joining in this session on stage that are speaking here. And uh, while uh, the room is uh, filling up, uh, more people are coming. I, I was told there's going to be a bus uh, that has a little delay, and it's about 25 people. Here they go. That's it. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, take a seat at a table uh, close to the stage. And don't uh, be afraid to um, engage. Uh, open up your laptop, because you will need it. One, one laptop per table would be nice. Um, if one table has multiple laptops, then um, you know maybe you want to share your laptop with... Uh, can I suggest that you start a second table? Yeah, good idea. Probably more people coming, but a group of six is ideal for uh, having discussions, which is uh, some, some, of, uh, some of the time of this presentation will be uh, you guys discussing uh, some, of the, some of the issues. And um, since everything is recorded, uh, many people will be able to see what our distinguished speakers will be uh, talking about today. And it's, um, we have a fabulous lineup of uh, great people with lots of background and knowledge about this uh, uh, topic. Uh, I, I also think it's one of the first times ever uh, that the session of this uh, nature is being held at uh, EIBTM or IMEX or any of the uh, uh, industry trade shows. Um, and so I think it's a good start that we have today, uh, the four speakers that we have. And uh, I will start with our first speaker who um, doesn't need to come on stage yet. I'll just quickly introduce the speakers uh, one by one. Uh, Greg Van Dyke is our first speaker. Thank you, Greg, for flying over from <coughs> the United States of America and to join us here today. Uh, Greg is the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing in a company called PSAV, which is a, a really big company in audiovisual production, technology, and all sorts of services for uh, presentations and uh, meetings. Our second speaker, a speaker is a very creative guy from a production company in the UK. Um, his name is Alan White, and he's with uh, Cascade Productions, um, a man with lots of experience and I'm sure he's going to show us a couple of really creative uh, things today. Then we have um, Alan is, by the way, the CEO of the of the production company. Um, then we have Lars uh, Sandlund, who is from uh, Dataton, and Dataton is actually the company that is uh, enabling us to do this wide uh, screen presentation. He's a COO, and he's going to share some of the secrets. Uh, uh, take us a little bit behind the stage, so to speak, on this uh, uh, set as well. And then finally, we have Michael uh, Michael Gerard from uh, Barco in Belgium, and he's representing Barco for ClickShare, which I think is a fabulous uh, device for presentations. Uh, you'll be you'll be really interested to see what this is all about. It's really something else, and it enables you to do something that has was not possible before. And uh, we look forward to your uh, input and ideas on this on this new uh, technology as well. So everything that you will see here today, I think you will be able to take home um, many ideas from all the presentations and apply to your meetings and, and uh, events in the future. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for uh, another 85 uh, minutes now on uh, presentation techniques. And, and so... It's with great pleasure uh, I would like to also announce that we have Meeting Sphere here today. And Paul Nunes Deo is going to uh, introduce <coughs> you all uh, to Meeting Sphere. Uh, and this is going to be our technology to have you co create uh, some of the output of this uh, session as well. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Do you have a microphone or do you want to use this? Okay. 
Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everyone. So we are in a fresh track, and in fresh, we want to innovate in the way we conduct uh, meetings. Uh, so we are going to ask for each table to appoint a table host that is going to use some instructions to become uh, connected to our system and to give us feedback from the group as the presenters to their session. So uh, I would ask for anyone with a laptop to please volunteer to become table host. So please stand up, anyone who has a laptop. Fantastic, we have one table host here. Please remain stand up so I can, sorry about this, so one table host. Let him, let him have a round of applause for this table host, if you please, because it's a volunteer. Keep, keep standing up, keep standing up, keep standing up. Yes, we need to anchor people around you, so you'll see. Okay, so we have another volunteer there, another table host, so a round of applause for Another table host that we have here. That's fantastic. Table host in this table with a device that could be connected to internet and get some instructions. No more devices available. Tablets, Android, iPads. Okay, so we have two tables. Let's have uh, people without, uh, we have a backup here, okay. Anyone wants to use uh, to volunteer as a table host in this part of the room? Well, table, a table host is not that difficult job, right? What you have to do is to make sure that all the opinions in the group are heard, and then you have to summarize the conclusions into the system. So, any volunteers for this? Maybe you, volunteer, okay, another? Two volunteers, good, can you stand up, please? Two table hosts here. You also volunteer? No? Okay, please stand up. Thank you very much. And a round of applause for another table host. So good. We have three table hosts appointed. So I'm going now to ask you, please, to come to this table, which is perhaps uh, closer to the center. Is that okay? And um, I'll ask participants to follow the table hosts for this table here. So it's very, very weird that we have so, 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 Low number of devices in this room. Normally, everybody brings a laptop or a oh, another an iPad. For, okay, so you can have another. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So this is presentation techniques in the fresh track. So uh, can you come to this table, please? And we are going to be giving you a device to connect to them. Okay, there's some instructions here, so maybe your table host assistant can assist you in connecting the device. Martin, if you can please hand that spray. And we have another iPad for another table host volunteer. You have, good. Can you, can you volunteer to be a table host? A round of applause for this gentleman as well. Okay, I'm going to ask you to change to another table, maybe this table here. Is it the above and beyond PowerPoint? Yes, okay. yes. This is above and beyond the PowerPoint, obviously. Presentation techniques. Great, so you can sit here can and, yes, please. Join the table. Anyone who is without a table host, please uh, join the table with a table host. They're standing up for you to have a reference, so this table is complete. Is it, it's mandatory for this session that you belong in a table with a table host. So please cooperate. It's going to be in your interest if you are going to take advantage of the speakers we have today and make the most of this session for your benefit. Please join a table with a table host, okay? Okay, fantastic. So we have the tables collected here. So there's some instructions so you can please Follow these instructions to connect your devices to the system. Okay. And whilst the table host is trying to connect the device to the system, maybe you could do a quick round of presentations so you get to know each other in the table and present yourselves. You're going to be working as a group during this session, so it could be a well a good time to present each other, change business cards, 
and get to know each other. Have, have you got your device? Have you got a device here? No. Oh. Okay. So I think Martin is trying to configure your device. Good. So let's spend two more minutes in introducing each other. You a password for your internet? Yes, EABTM. Thank you. Good, so this table is already set to go. Are you sure you don't want to take part in the table? Positive. You are okay here? Okay, that's good. We call in open space technology participants that want, want to make sure they are part of the tables. We call them in the open space technology jargon, we call them butterflies. It's a, a nice way to participate also in meetings. Okay, uh, no, I think, uh, Martin, you're trying to configure the table host here, right? Fantastic. Okay, this table is already joining. So we have a challenge for the groups as a warm-up exercise. The challenge for the group would be to find what are your unfulfilled ambitions as a meeting professional that you want to accomplish in the future. Okay. So think as a group of what are your unfulfilled ambitions as a meeting professional that you want to accomplish in the near future, right? And the table host needs to quickly moderate the discussions in order to get to reflect on the, on the system what would those ambitions be. You're doing great here. So far it's great. Good, join. join. Fantastic. So this table host configured the net network from scratch. Good. Okay, so we need now your input in the system on what will be the unfulfilled ambitions as a meeting professional. So let's spend uh, four more minutes here. Okay, so now we are seeing in the system, in the large screen, in our group screen, already part of your production. Fantastic, great. So let's browse a little bit. I would like to get enough, I would like to get through the 400 people conference in December in the US with 150 participant laptops without technical issues. Ooh, good, that's a good ambition to actually enjoy the presentation by being comfortable on stage. Mm. I want to work with court juries and support a simple process where they can collaborate effectively and make good decisions on people's guilt or not. I see this group process as utterly flawed and want to introduce meeting productivity tools to this environment to make some radical changes. Wow, that's wonderful. That's a great ambition. Yes, you need to follow the instructions in the sheet, which is... Yeah, we need to Sorry about that. This is <laughs> our table oats are really technological wizards. They are solving all sorts of problems. It's fantastic. So, sure. <laughs> okay, We're, we have to finish the time now. Okay, so don't worry. This is a warm-up exercise. We will have more time to work productively as teams in your tables for the round, for the next session. Now let's pay attention of our present, uh, presenters now and make sure that if you have any comments, quick questions, you can also use the system to, pl to pl put your questions. Okay, um, next is uh, our uh, American friend, uh, Greg Van Dyke from PSAV, and he has an amazing, in, an amazing uh, presentation on uh, stuff that uh, you know, I was really happy to learn uh, when I saw him speak in the uh, in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. So, Greg, the floor is all yours. Great, thank you. And uh, he says the American friend because I keep running into my, uh, my Dutch ancestors here with Van Dyke and they try to speak to me in Dutch. I so apologize because uh, 
I'm afraid I can't quite do that, but uh, I can suffer through some German, but you probably would not enjoy it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, and I think we'll address some of the issues that people brought up on uh, that, those, those ideas earlier about uh, emotions, because I think what, what we sometimes lose sight of is uh, how everything relates back to your emotions. So what, what are the objectives when you have a meeting? Do you have an objective for the meeting? And so often we talk to people and they're, they're terrified to start with that blank piece of paper. So instead they just dust off what they did last time and do that same meeting again. And I think that really loses sight of the important question of what experience do you want your meeting attendees to have? And I very much like the word experience because if, if you look at the dictionary, experience describes the question of uh, uh, what things you choose to, to do and what things are happening to you that you don't necessarily choose to do. So they're both, when in, in a meeting environment, both are happening to you. And from an experience standpoint, we really do experience everything through our brains. Now my wife will tell you sometimes I appear to act as though I don't have a brain, but actually everyone here in a room does have a brain and that's how we actually experience everything that we do. And have you thought a lot when you're in a meeting, do you really think about how you access that brain? At the end of the day, you're here for some message, some reason to engage the audience. And the way you engage the audience is simply through our senses. Our senses are the gateway to the brain and really audiovisual techniques are essentially the gateway to activate the senses to activate the brain. It's pretty quite simple. So taste, touch, hearing, smell, and sight. Now four of those we'll be addressing during today's presentation. Unfortunately, I won't be cooking, so you don't have the chance to enjoy the, the, the smell today, but we'll be able to, to, to address quite a few of these things today. Let's talk about how a memory actually works. Um, sensory memory is essentially almost something that we would call subconscious memory and something we're not even aware of. So the ratio of senses that we are bombarded with to what we, we actually become aware of is actually a million to one. So think about that. At any one moment, there's a million senses that are bombarding you. Even right now, it's, um, uh, it could be the heat of the room or the coffee or the lack of coffee. Are you thirsty? Is it loud? Is there a distraction back there? Are the lights? All these senses, which one do you choose to become aware of? And from there, once you become aware of it, it has a chance to enter your working memory. Now the working memory is sort of like a sieve. Things are constantly going in and things are constantly going out. Uh, and in fact, it seems like the, the typical adult brain is able to hold about four things in the brain at once. So about four po points of working memory in your brain at once. And if you don't reinforce that bit of learning uh, in about 30 seconds, it's gone. However, once you sort of become aware of something and you have a chance to sort of reinforce, engage you in that piece of memory, it can enter your long-term memory. Now, what's something in your long-term memory sort of like a file cabinet? And that's where you sort of store it for long-term, and you can sort of always, from your working memory, reach in, draw back that piece of memory, and in effect, we align all these bits of senses, we put it into a cognitive scheme, and we put it all together into a single file that sort of helps us make sense of the world. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is how we kind of use all these techniques, and the techniques you're seeing today are ways to activate the senses, to become aware, put in the working memory, align that memory so you can retrieve it long term, which a long term is at the end of the day is how we achieve the objectives for our meeting, be it excitement, be it change, be it emotion, it's all done by activating these senses and working on this memory processing chain. So the, 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 the big point I'll, I'll be asked you to take away, and this is, my, my, this is where I have a chance to really sound intelligent, is the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. CTML, the Cognitive Theory of Multimedia Learning, which essentially states that the more, op the more chances you can align the senses to uh, engage in the same bit of fact, the higher the opportunities that they will retain that piece of information. So this is a university study, and Lee and Bowers organized this university study, and they asked people to uh, read some information and then take a test, and they later tested them again. Now some people were just tested again without doing any reinforcement, or some people had a chance for a little bit of help. Some people had a chance to actually hear the material, uh, hear the material alone. Well, those people actually had a 7% increase in retention from people who had no, no information. So just hearing the information again, 7% increase in retention. Some people were able to just read the text again, a 12% increase in retention. But if I go all the way up here to the far left-hand stage, uh, the people were able to both hear the information and see reinforcing graphics on the information, uh, they actually had in this case, they actually had a 71% increase in learning. So again, you think of that from, a, from a, a visual standpoint, if you're able to provide a compelling graphic, 
a well-lit opportunity, uh, and it provides some engaging material around there. We actually have a 71% increase in learning opportunity for someone versus someone just hearing that information by themselves. And the basic principle here, again, is that you're aligning the auditory and the visual and all ways to engage these memories together to help reinforce your single point. So there's a great opportunity to reinforce that learning. What I also find interesting is that uh, if you start thinking about how you might go about do, uh, reinforcing that learning, vision is such a compelling part. It takes about 50% of the brain's resources go into vision. And I think John Medina said that uh, visual processing doesn't just, uh, isn't just the primary form, it dominates all, all of our learning. So in this case, uh, we, I think it was, um, I'm going to forget the research, about 83% of adult learning is done through visual. So again, just think about it. If you spend a lot of money for a great speaker and you fail to light the speaker, uh, actually, the people want to actually see how the words and see how the lips are forming. It's all part of the way you actually engage that speaker and get the benefit for that speaker. So again, lights, graphics, and visuals. Visuals are such a compelling way for us to communicate information. And what's also interesting is please, when you're, and I know you're going to get some really interesting ideas later on today. Uh, about how you can sort of use these screens and the scenic to develop a compelling communication visual. Because the worst thing we can do, has anyone ever heard the phrase death by PowerPoint? And the reason it's called death by PowerPoint, we were talking about this earlier, is that most of us, when we have a presenter, fail to spend any time planning. We'll hear some time about some, later on today about planning for your presentation. They just sit there and they type up the text, the words on the slides. If all you have are words on the slides, and I'm saying those exact words again, the brain almost, you're reducing the adult learning. The brain is sort of like, why? They're looking for something additive. So again, you want to have compelling graphics are a far better way to deliver that communication. You'll see some great ideas how to do that today. And one simple way, simply, how about just putting up some sort of a graphic animation to deliver the tool? Far more compelling than if I actually had bullet points up here describing the bit-by-bit -bit process of how a water wheel operates and how the force of one gets the other one going. Visually, it's such a more compelling way. And in particular, in today's world, with animation and with video, people want to see video content. They want to see action. They just don't want to see the static slides anymore today. So. One last topic I want to discuss, what I think find particularly compelling when it comes to a preparing an engaging presentation is color. And I love color when it comes a chance to discuss what's going on for a meeting. So um, what I find fascinating is that if you're having a meeting where it's very important that the audience is working on very detailed content, statistically they will do better in a warm color environment, a reds, the yellows, they will do statistically better in detail and statistically worse on creative tasks. Now, if you want people to be engaged in what I'll call more of a, of a creative idea, brainstorming, uh, design work, they will do statistically better in a cool color environment, your blues, your greens, than they will in a, uh, in a red room, and so vice versa. So have you ever thought about, <coughs> excuse me, have you ever thought about what it is you're asking your, your meeting attendees to do and tried to design a color to help them do that? You know, I just look at this scene, there's something inherently peaceful about the blue sign of the ocean, or the blue sign here, and uh, it, it's very purposefully we're using a bit of nature here. Because again, actually just showing, a, put, incorporating a, a nature visual, or ideally nature itself into the room itself, can uh, generate up to 19% more ideas in a session. So again, great opportunities to develop colors and nature together to help you develop a schema. But then of course, you know, with technology today, there's a lot of flexibility. You can do this. So well, you can take the same room set. These are all pictures of the exact same room set, and they can be changed with LED lighting, uh, with different gobos. So if you have this, if you embrace this idea that you can change the impact of a room, and just think about this screen and the unlimited canvas we have here, and what we can do with this from a design standpoint is really compelling. So again, there's wonderful opportunities without changing the room set physical layout if we think a little bit more creatively about our space. But please remember, more is not better. It has to be done tastefully, it has to be planned out, and you have to really think about what you want from a color and success standpoint. And then lastly, even what I find fascinating again is that even where you position your visuals can have a compelling impact upon memory. So are you trying to, if you have something above eye level, is the best way to actually stimulate visual, is it, it will help with recall. If you want people to be engaged and discuss the material, it should be at eye level. And if you want really strong feelings, it'll be slightly below eye level. And I just think about, I always think the masters of 
placement are probably your consumer product companies because they have a down to an art form of exactly where it should be on the shelf from a, a pricing standpoint. So again, let's apply all these principles to a meeting environment standpoint and think what we can do. So my question for you all here to discuss very briefly is if you consider some of the things I talked about today, what can you all do differently, be it in your site visits or in your meeting, uh, in planning for a meeting to engage things differently when you go out to, uh, to, uh, to engagement? For instance, a simple one might be I can incorporate color into my site visits. So what are some ideas that you might have considering this information to better plan for your meetings going forward? And I'll let you have that, some discussion on that and input into the system. Okay, thanks, Greg. You want to see the questions in your screen sure. now? Please. Mark, if you can broadcast the questions that we have so far, and now the tables, if they want to ask some more questions. So, good. Why graphic alone enforces learning more than graphic and reading? Uh, to that specific question, while people are still talking here, um, I would refer you to the actual research. You can go to psv.com slash sensational science and download the white paper and you can actually source the specific uh, study. I would imagine that case is it has to do with uh, the graphic being in a live environment versus in a reading environment, but I have to go back to the actual specific case study and research that specific question. But again, the white paper is free, psv.com slash sensational science. You can actually read the, the, the source itself, but that's my belief. But I'd want to, again, source that specifically to answer that question. Okay, great. So another question is, uh, consider what can you all do differently in your site visits or planning to engage in different better way? That's a cheap one because that's the question I'm asking this group right now today. So uh, we're about to see these answers here. Okay. And no. uh, a good one here is a, a great idea was to use interactive technology to support audience engagement. Absolutely. I think we have some wonderful techniques to, to get people better involved. So. Okie doke. More questions from any of the tables? Is anyone typing a question now? Remember that we still, we're going to have 20 minutes in the end of this block of presentations for further discussion and for more input from you, right? So the, while you're thinking about there, you know, what started us on this research is planners consistently asked us, as a technology company, you're always asking us to spend more money on technology, why? And can you help us demonstrate that if we need to spend more money, does it actually help enhance adult learning. So I would hope that you can take away quickly from this that I had to go through very quickly, but there's a lot of data that suggests that if you better design your meetings, are a bit more creative about using audiovisual techniques to engage the senses, it's a great way for you to actually use the senses to increase memory and increase the adult learning. And I would argue at the end of the day, you're having a meeting because you want something to change, something should act differently, and that requires you to access that long-term memory. And again, AB is simply the way to access the census, to take it from there. So uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, talking to you all later. All right, thank you, Greg. Well done. Nice and short. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Alan White from uh, Cascade Productions. And uh, Alan, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Morning, everyone. So um, my presentation is about going beyond the bullet slide. Um, I've spent a lifetime or too long with presentations. We're dealing with people who create presentations and uh, I've seen lots and lots and lots of PowerPoint and death by PowerPoint and, and we experience it daily. So I'm going to tell a story to start us off about Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address, which you'll be wondering what's that got to do with uh, meeting planning today. Um, the Gettysburg Address was 150 years ago this week. Uh, and the meeting planners did a good job by all accounts. It was held in a great venue. It was on the, the top of the highest hill in the battlefield. And it was for the consecration of, uh, of that battlefield. And there was 15,000 people attended. And they draped it with flags and banners and made it grand. And apparently, this was long before PAs were invented, it was so quiet, every word could be heard by everyone, which I find slightly hard to believe. But the actual presentation was done by a guy called Edward Everett, who was a senator, and he spoke for two hours and delivered the real Gettysburg Address for two hours. And when it finished, the congregation sang a hymn and then invited the president to say a few words. And Lincoln at the time was, was notorious for talking for hours and hours and hours. His usual presentations were up to four hours. 
And so he stood and presented uh, this speech that, I mean, I'm not from the States and I didn't do this in school, but I know this speech or know of it uh, well. It's very, very famous. It lasted for two minutes. And he said everything that Edward Everett had said for two hours in two minutes with no PowerPoint. It's worth mentioning. So today, we experience this a lot. So this is a, this is a typical slide that's done for print that people bind in books and present. And then it gets put into a PowerPoint presentation and put onto a screen. And then people switch off really quickly. So too much information is a big problem. And our day-to-day -day life, because we're a production company, is doing things like this. So we do everything Greg's talked about. We use light, we use color, we use sound, we use effects, we use all sorts of different things and entertainment, and we change the mood and create experiences. That's the idea and bring things to life. Um, but a lot of the rules that we apply and the principles we apply and the things I'm talking about here apply equally in small meetings and in completely different environments. Um, I don't know how many or who's not familiar with TED Talks, but TED Talks are a, a biannual uh, thing that happens in America and in the UK. And what they do is they invite speakers to come and talk about their ideas to change the world. And the, the rule is you can come and present your ideas to change the world. You can use whatever media you like. Some people sing, some people play guitars, some people put on the screen. But the rule is you're not allowed to spend longer than 20 minutes. And this is a, a key for us. So this is, there is lots of research to support this. I'm not going to share the research. This is what we use as a guide, that we have a 40 second, five minute and 20 minute principle, that you have 40 seconds to capture the imagination of your audience. If you've done that, it earns you the right to talk for five minutes. If you've still got everybody after five minutes, then you earn 20. But at 20 minutes, you've gone because people don't want to hear a voice after 20 minutes. So something has to change. We call it a change of voice. And it can be a change of voice, literally, as we are doing, changing presenters. Um, but equally, it can be all lots of different things. So the, I mean, I've put some examples here. The list is, is, is infinite. And there are lots and lots and lots of tools. And I'm going to flip through some of these examples in a minute. But literally, just, just changing so that the voice stops talking is the key. Video is, a, is an easy one. It's a really powerful tool, video. And nowadays, you don't need a video, video production department. You don't need to create your own video because lots of people are on Facebook. You'll be, you'll be aware of Vine or Vimeo. There are lots of resources for video. There are lots and lots of videos that tell the story you want to tell or that are an analogy for what you want to say that you can apply. And it costs nothing. And put them in your presentation and break it up. I'm going to show you one in a minute just to give you an idea. So on to a different story. This is a guy called Michael Faraday, who was a physicist. And this picture depicts a scene 50 years before Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, uh, where he's presenting the first Christmas lecture for the Royal Institution in London. And this has become, um, it's an annual event, and it was started to teach children because there were no formal schools for most at the time. So it started to teach children, and it's gone on to become literally an institution. And lots of families sit around at Christmas and watch it on television. Um, and what they do is they literally they'll pick a topic and bring it to life. And they bring it to life with mainly experimentation. So they'll, they'll talk and then do an experiment and show people and demonstrate. And they do that because they know that children's attention span isn't great. So they need to keep breaking it up. Now that principle is nearly 200 years old, is an example of it. And yet we mostly don't do it in normal meeting formats. So let me just show you a little bit. This is a video off YouTube. Uh, of last year's uh, Christmas lecture. This is a Tesla coil then, and it can generate a million volts. We've had some problems with this bit of kit. It basically fries all the cameras, all the electrics, all the lights. Uh, so this really should give us some uh, rather impressive lightning. Now, I must ask everyone just to remain in your seats for this demonstration. Let's see how we go.
There's a couple of curious things to say about that. Um, what is that venue is the same venue. They've done it in the same venue every year. Um, the other is that the technicians who prepare those experiments, they find out the topic in September for a Christmas lecture. So they get three months to plan and prepare to bring it to life. And I think that's a pretty good guide in an ideal world that we would do that. So let me just flick through. I'm going to go through at speed just some of these examples of the types of things you do to, to break after 20 minutes. So the change of presenter is the obvious one. And that might be there are two people on stage and you change the voice. It might be you literally change the presenter. Sometimes people have more content and want to talk for longer. And this is one of our big challenges. So it's how do we break one presenter who's got an hour slot into 20 minute chunks is part of the challenge. So another one is to tell a story. So this is a presenter who's telling a story about um, the Antarctic explorer Shackleton uh, recruiting for people. Hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, constant danger, return doubtful. Um, it's an interesting story. Stopping for discussion is something we're doing here this morning, so you can form your own views about whether that works, um, as is voting and feedback. So we've got here, on one side, you've got handsets or technological solutions for, for taking feedback and live feedback. I mean, we're getting questions live here on, on stage. Uh, on the other side are simpler, cheaper methods where we can literally write things down. Discussion panels. So can I present, can I present 20 minutes and then stop and have a discussion with some other experts on it? Um, this is, um, this is asking audience questions with a big audience, and this is called a talking ball. I love it. It's a foam ball with a microphone in it, and we literally throw it into the audience, and where it lands, we ask them to ask a question or give us an opinion. Um, this is a, the back channel. This is a, I mean, it's a buzzword. I don't know how familiar you are, but the idea is that if there are people watching online now and they're on Twitter and, and they can ask questions and we display it and stop, and so I stop talking about what I'm talking about and talk about what the audience is talking about. Uh, and so that's the, the, the remote audience and the audience in the room. We can stop and do some recognition if it's appropriate. We can have a professional host or a specialist presenter who works with us and, and, and engages as breaks. And then there's some more quirky things. So this is a human graph because this is a finance guy and he always does graphs and he's really dull. So what we've done is we've given him a human graph. So each graph he presented, the people changed the shape of the graph. And that's it worked. It was memorable. Um, going back to Greg's point, dance and song and dance, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't apply everywhere. But where, it, where it's possible, just by introducing theater, entertainment, you create lots of energy, lots of inspiration. Uh, and in these two examples, the one on the left is a choir, actually from the audience who practiced and came and did a bit. The one on the right is uh, a live band on stage who played links to walk up to, like you would see on a Friday night talk show, if you like. Memorable moments. So if you've got an overriding message and you can create a memorable moment, I mean, these things may look bizarre, having stormtroopers at your lectern or having people doing a parkour across your set. Um, they were relevant to the presentation, so I'm not suggesting throw something in just for the sake of it, but there are, if it's relevant and you can do something, to me, anything's possible. These are, um, these are members of the audience who are, um, who are who've prepared performance pieces. So one's doing a, a baton, a relay baton handover, and using that to symbolize their message. Um, and the other, I don't actually know why they're dressed up like that, but the, the, these, again, it's memorable moments, completely different things. They're not happening on slide. That's the important thing. And then we've got theatre. I mean, this is actually the one on the, one on, on the right is a breakout group. It's a, a, a normal conference meeting. It's a breakout group where you've got 10 people attending a breakout meeting, and they're getting a fashion show. They're actually getting a fashion show of a product. Um, on the left, we're replicating a TV show, so it's a, it's a challenge where people have to collect things from snakes um, on stage. It's just it's breaking up, and it's, it, 
it has to be relevant. Um, so these are props that have been used on stage. So on, on the left, there's, there's movement. So there's theatre, there's movement. A big physical prop is something you would normally just put on the slide. But because it's in the hand, it becomes more memorable. And here, we've actually created a complete environment to create the memory with a bit of fun. Um, this example is quite extreme. This is, um, we called it a living slide. What we've done, instead of presenting all of these products on slides that would go through one after the other, we've built a shop. And the presenter had a, a video camera, a thumb video camera, and walked along and pointed them out as he went along. And then to end this section, this is um, to link back to our Christmas lectures. This is a chief exec who we believe puts a spark into a business, who we put a million volts around it because um, he was game for a laugh, and it wreaked havoc with our equipment too. But we've had flying carpets. The, the bottom right is a snow trick, so the presenter walks on with some snow in his hands and, and dropped the snow in front of a fan and created it. We were talking about Christmas. So all things are possible. So, I mean, I've shown you some really varied different techniques there. Some of them are extreme, some of them are expensive, um, some of them are free. Um, the key is that they have to be, they have to be relevant above all, and, and these, all of these things apply. Um, this guy was widely regarded as one of the, the great speakers, and his, his stage set was consistent and very simple. The slides and support material he had behind him was always very simple and bold. But he understood the theatre bit too. I mean, this, was the, this is a photograph from the launch of the iPod Nano, where uh, I don't know whether anyone was, has seen it or recalls it, but he pulled out an iPod Nano out of that pocket in your jeans and said that's what the pocket was for. This is, this is just a little bit of theatre, and, and it created a memory. And while he's renowned for the... While he's renowned for the, the, the bold and simplicity of his, his keynote, in his case, not PowerPoint, um, he also understood this chunking rule. So in 2007, when he launched the iPhone, that was Apple's first phone. It was the first smartphone properly. It was the first multi-touch interface. Uh, he introduced the App Store. So this was, I mean, how much content it was in the one presentation. It was a 50-minute presentation. So that's long by our standards. 50-minute presentation. But he had the content, and you could argue the CRISPR. He mentioned iPhone, the name, within the first five minutes. He showed his first demonstration at 15 minutes and his first video at 20 minutes. He went on to do another three demonstrations. So that 50 minutes was chunked. He might not have described it in these terms, but he applied the principle of it, and he understood the need to not just have the one voice. Now, I'm going to whiz to the end now and, do the, and, and hand over. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a variety of screen formats of how you can use a screen. And I'm not going to talk them in great detail, but they're just to, to provoke a bit of thought, really. So this is a, this is a triple screen. So we're, we're in a single screen set here. Um, this is an example of a triple screen. So the side screens are available to do something different with from the main one, like the back channel, for example. A split screen. So single screen, but split. Two screens. We mostly use when we've got a very wide audience, but can be used for different things. Pa plasma screens, increasingly, because they're getting bigger and bigger and more useful to us. Um, we call this immersive, so we've created an environment here. This is another breakout group. It's a breakout group of about 30 people, um, but they're actually sat in the environment of which the screen's are part. Uh, this is a multi-screen one where all the screens are different things at different times. Similarly, this one's an interesting challenge. This is, this is where the screen isn't the story of the day. So the sessions are running on picnic tables, in actual fact, and they're not. The screen isn't the, the, the real story, so the screen isn't where everyone's pointed. This has a dance area on one side and a screen on the other. Again, what the person physically is doing is as important as the screen, so the screen gets set to the side. And then this is something you'll see more and more on TV shows. This is an LED back wall, so the whole set is an LED screen, and the LED screen can change and turn into do whatever we want. And as you can see, that's combined with physical theatre. We've driven that taxi onto a stage in the middle of a presentation. Um, 
ever popular projection mapping. So this is an, a, an example of projection mapping in a cube set, but in this room is a, is a fabulous example of projection mapping, which you're about to hear more of. Uh, and this is a blended screen where we've got one single continuous image that we can play with and add things and punch things into. And, and I suppose this is, um, this is the real challenge, really, that, that we know that anyone, per, you could walk in here now with a laptop, with a presentation that you'd knocked up on the way here on the plane or the train, and plug it in and talk and present and read from the slides. And I think this is my big challenge, and this is the challenge to you, effectively, is to say, if, when that is possible and everyone knows they can, how do we stop it happening? How do we stop people falling into only doing presentations that they do because they know they can do them. Because the capability is there, why do we do it? Because more preparation time means more possibilities. You can add in any of these tricks and many, many more and introduce all the light and colour and theatre if you have more um, if you have more time to prepare, as we saw with the Royal Institution. And to bring it full circle and finish off, this is what Lincoln said about preparation. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six hours sharpening my axe. And I think that's about right. So that's it from me. My question to you to discuss is, uh, with the technology available to us to do everything instantly, how do we stop that happening? Thanks. Thanks a lot, Alan. Okay. Uh, I, I am, I'm sorry to tell you that you exceed a little bit your time for questions. So we, you are going to be allowed on, only to answer one question from the one we see from the screen. Obviously, we still are going to save him time for the last of the the end of the presentation to have a joint discussion. If you can have the screen now. Backup system, all is the point. So, oh, uh, we have here the question. 17 got, and 18. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we've got so a question there up, about holograms. So pick up one question from, there, from, uh, from this so list. So the, holo the hologram system is a, is a system called Musion. Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, and it's, a, it's an old theatrical trick called Pepper's Ghost, where you, you reflect a, a picture from a screen off something, a piece of um, mirrored material that you can't see, and it creates the illusion of a hologram of a real person. Um, and when it's done well, you can have someone on stage life-size, and you'll have seen this in, uh, perhaps in different places. Some, um, some rock acts have used it, and... Um, uh, I've seen it done where people have put Freddie Mercury back into Queen, for example, or Richard Branson's appeared at a conference because he couldn't be there, so he appears as his virtual character. Uh, I, I haven't personally used it, but I know of it, and I know of lots of examples where it's worked very, very well. It's expensive and complicated to rig them. Over to you now. So. All right, good, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I thought this was a pretty interesting presentation, a, a couple of crazy ideas. and. Uh, <laughs> And simple things. It doesn't always have to be uh, complicated, like the people holding the bars to, you know, show the graph and everything. So I, uh, I think creativity is definitely something you need uh, or you can use when you do uh, uh, presentations and you try to improve presentations. So, also thank you for all your input. Um, we are uh, watching all the questions and we'll be happy to uh, process those in a in a later stage as well. Let me have a look at my paper for the next speaker. Um, Lars Sandlund um, is representing a COO, Dataton, and he's um, going to tell us a little more about the backdrop uh, system and how to use it. He's got some interesting ways of uh, uh, presenting uh, and using the system in the background. So Lars, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Greg and Alan, for those last minute tips. I'll see if I throw in a dance move or, or sing a Swedish drinking song if you guys look too bored. Um, there we are. Okay, Dataton. Um, Dataton is one of those companies uh, who you probably never heard of, but you probably most certainly have seen our product. And actually, you're looking at one of our products right now. 
it's not me, it's, it's what we have here in the background, this uh, multi-display presentation system that control and runs the content over these screens. And what I would like to do here today is to actually put this thing in, in, in well, focus on this thing, because what we believe in, in a present, presentation situation, what's presented should be in focus, of course, uh, not what's presenting it. But uh, this time I will actually focus on what's presenting it. Um, let's see. So what I will talk about today is what is this? What is it we have here in the background? And I will also explain how you can use it. How can it be used in a presentation situation? And then I will also uh, discuss what do we as a developer within this field envisage for the future? Now, before I, I jump into the future, I would like to, to, to take a few steps back and, and rewind the tape uh, all the way back to 1973, actually, because that was when Dataton was founded, which means that we are celebrating our 40th birthday this year, which also means that we're one of the older uh, companies within the AV industry. And we actually started with doing this. And that's not me in the picture. It's a, it's a former colleague of mine. It's, and, and he's sitting in front of Datatone's first product. And can anyone see what it is? Any guesses? Kind of. It's actually a synthesizer. And that's how we got our name, Datatone. Datatone means computer tune in Swedish. So we're a Swedish company. Uh, so this guy is sitting in front of the Datatone synthesizer, and this is how it looked like. There was pieces that was put together, and uh, yeah, worked like this. That's our uh, founder, Björn, with, with actually one of ABBA's uh, sound producer. Now, together with, with the synthesizer system, we, we started to, to develop a slide projector system because people back then wanted to have psychedelic sound to go together with the psychedelic music. You know, this was back in the 70s. Um, and after a while, we figured out there were more people interesting in the visuals than in the synths. So we changed focus, and we developed a slide projector system that looked something like this. It was hardware and software, uh, and you connected these old school slide projectors, and what you could do is, well, the result looked like something like this. Large screens, different pictures, and you can control everything from, from, uh, one's, uh, well, from, one, from one computer. And this worked well for us for, uh, well, for during the 80s and 90s, but in the end, well, around 98, 99, something happened, and we call it some, a convergence of technology. Um, people were used to do more and more creative stuff with their PCs, and the PCs had become uh, cheaper and a lot faster. Same thing for digital projectors, also a lot cheaper, and the performance had also uh, increased a lot. And the third element was digital file formats. All of these MP3s and, and, and other digital formats made it so much easier for people to put together their uh, shows and, and be creative. So for those people to go back and work with slide projectors didn't really work out. So what we did and what many other companies uh, within the AV industry did was that we digitalized our system. And today it's a software and it's called Watchout. And again, that's what we're using here to control uh, the, the pictures here in the background. And watch out works like this. Back there, we have Mark and, and the team uh, with a production uh, computer, a normal PC. That PC is connected, well, first of all, into the PC, into the production software, you can put any kind of content, pictures, movies, graphics, anything. And when you're done with that, you just connect it to, a, to the network, to display computers, other PCs, that's connected with the, with the projectors we have here in the background. And then you can control the, the, the pictures over using projectors, using screens or LED walls. So you use Watchout when you want to go beyond the single screen format. 
And here's some examples of what you can do. Here we have a big seamless panorama. It's from a trade show hall in, in Philadelphia, where you can see that the content is, is move, well, is going over the different surfaces, but it just looked like one image. So the system here, edge blend is the, the picture. So it looks like just one giant screen. Another example we have is, is from Universal Studios in, in uh, Japan, or a Christmas show, where the system controls the content over the walls, but also calculates so it looks nice on the 3D surface. So this is all projected. And a last example is, is from the world's biggest TV studio in Abu Dhabi, Al Jazeera. Uh, where they have a number of different displays. They have LED screens, they have LCD screens, and they also have projected surfaces. And they control everything from just one laptop. Now, so that, this, is a, this have been our, well, this have been what we've been working with for, for quite some time now. Large pictures, non-standard formats. And it, well, it, it works well for us, but what we've seen is kind of the same trend as we saw back in, in 98, that people's everyday technical habits have changed. And uh, for us, this trend has never been as obvious as right now. Um, and with, with that, I mean that when, we, when, our, when our technical habits change, the thing that we expect from professional technology also changes. So now, I mean, we can, we can get any kind of information whenever we want. We can interact with information, and we can spread our thoughts about the information, and we also, we are getting used to get the information off the wall into the rooms with, with 3D. We want more than just pre-produced content on flat screens. So that is what we are working with, and that, was, that is what many other uh, companies within, within the AV industry is working with right now. And I will show you an example. It's from a trade show in, in uh, Detroit a few months ago. And I will play it for you now, and then I will explain afterwards what's going on here. Here's the problem with the auto show in Detroit. There's all these cool cars everywhere, but the problem is you can't drive any of them. Ford might have solved that problem with this virtual exhibit that puts you in the driver's seat. The problem is, it's not for the faint of heart, but it is one of the coolest things on display here. Did you get that? No? Half real? No. The later was real, yeah. Everything was on the screen, but yes, the, the later was real. So, so this is what happens. She's standing in front of a screen, so she looks at the giant screen, and she's standing on the green screen with three cameras surrounding her. And so that picture from, from the three cameras is brought into to watch out and mixed together with pre-produced content with the, with the car spinning around. So when she's, she's looking at the screen, it looks like the car is spinning around her. And before she did that, she took her, her trade show badge, like the ones you're wearing now, and put that one on, on the transponder, which made her name pop up on the screen, which also made that Afterwards, uh, this, this movie clip was sent to, to her email uh, as a YouTube link, which she could you know, look at and, and send to her friends. 
And I mean, with people seeing this kind of stuff, the next time they go to a car show, they want to see something similar, of course. Um, but this is, okay, this is not rocket science any longer, um, but it's nothing that you uh, just, uh, you know, install 10 minutes before the show. But I, I will show you one last example that actually was installed four minutes before the show and see if, if we get this to work now. Um, uh, as, as you've seen, I control my, my keynote with, with a normal uh, Apple remote control, but now I'll, I'll start to, to control uh, the watch out presentation instead. I changed the background, now I'm using my cell phone. So I changed the background, let's see if I can get, see if I can get an animation to pop up here. Almost. Do we have a Wi-Fi breakdown, maybe? Almost? Sorry? <laughs> I think so. Mark, do you? All right, no. Restart the network. Here we go. Uh, so now I'm controlling the show from, from my iPhone over the wireless network. And I can, I can make this pig to move, hopefully, if we still are online. Here we go. Jump again. And if we want to add something, I'll see if I can have something on this side instead. There is Mr. Robot. And then we'll see if we can make the robot shoot the pig. All right. So, yeah, I know. Content is king, as to say. Well, um, <laughs> and, and the next last thing, uh, more serious maybe, uh, I'll see if we can get some news up here. Uh, there we are. Latest news from CNN. So what's happening here? I'm, I'm controlling this set with my iPhone over the wireless network. That means my colleagues back in Sweden could have done this. And this is live from the internet. So th these are some examples on, on the interactivity that we are working with and also other companies within the, this industry. Um, my question for you now is what do you see in the future when it comes to interaction and be interactive in, in presentation situations? Um, thank you very much for your time. It has been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay, so thanks a lot. Let's see if we have some questions here. We're running out of time. So I'm not inviting at this stage, um, at this point, lots of questions because we have time in the end for discussion with all speakers. Okay, how long before all the walls of a meeting room will be screens? Lars? Sorry? How long? before all the walls of a meeting room will be screens. And then oh. I'm almost sure who made this question. How long? Well, that, that's happening right now. That's happening it right is. now. Uh, we saw some examples, Alan had some examples. And yeah, sure. Do you use uh, augmented reality for the shows? Um, that's also something that we see coming more and more. Okay. I think this is a comment question. I what? think we need professional to manage this. It's complex and multi everything. Yeah, the comment, maybe you want to comment something. Correct. <laughs> That's why we have companies as, as allies. Yeah. Question from Lars. Right? Oh, that that, that was my question. Okay. okay, that's your question. Okay, do it. So thanks a lot. Thank you. How about you, Martin? Okay. Thank you, Lars. That was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and helps us a lot to understand uh, how this works. Uh, Michael uh, um, Girards is uh, going to set up uh, and he's going to share with us. Do you need more furniture to put it on? A little table or extra? Stuff? I have many devices, but I yeah. think it should work. Let's put it there. So I chair to put it on. I can, um, I can see that 
things are changing. Technology is, uh, is as always uh, influencing how we are doing things in life, and, and presentation is obviously uh, part of that. So um, I think one the, the, the device that uh, Michael is going to share now is also one of those uh, uh, things that will change the way presentations will be held uh, in the future. Michael? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, my name is Mar uh, Michael, not Martin. Uh, Michael, I'm working for Barco. Um, we saw some great stuff uh, by Greg, uh, Alan, Lars uh, with great technology and we are proud to supply part of these uh, technologies. Barco is one of the leading providers of projectors, LED walls, etc. So we can make fantastic things out of that. I want just to take you now out of such a fantastic room and go to smaller uh, meeting rooms, collaboration rooms, and see what we can do there. That is maybe easy or, or looks easy to, if, you, if I would explain you uh, easily. It, it looks easy, but it's not that easy, as easy as it is. Let me show you some, uh, some um, background of some, technolo te some technology we made. Sorry, I have to warm up a little bit. Um, when we go to small and medium-sized meeting rooms, we want to present stuff. And uh, typically what we do there is we come with our device and we search for a cable. I mean, this is a thing that we're all used to. And despite the fact that technology is moving very fast, we're still going to the room, uh, finding a cable, and then the stress starts. So will this cable work with my computer? Will the cable be long enough? Will I have the right connections on my computer? And then when you have connected your, your laptop to that, to that cable, and then you start thinking, okay, do I have the right resolution? Will it work on my, uh, will my computer fit to that projector or to that screen? It creates a lot of stress, sometimes delay, and at the end, a big cost for, for companies. The other thing is that uh, there is a trend that um, people, employees, uh, visitors, are uh, bringing their own devices to their meetings or to their events. So um, I came with an iPad, an Apple product. I have an um, Android device, it's a Samsung Galaxy. Uh, and I have my laptop. And I'm used to presenting uh, from my laptop to the screen or to a projector. But I'm also in trouble when I want to present something like images from a family. I want to present it to my colleagues. And I cannot do it from my iPad or from my uh, from my um, Android phone or an Apple phone. Um, bring your own device, that's what it stands for. People are used to bringing their own devices. It's a bit of a headache for um, IT personnel at companies, possibly as well for events organizers like you, but it's a great opportunity if you want people to share stuff from their phone or from their laptop with the audience, be it a small or big audience, it would be great if you could do that in an easy way. Um, the last thing is that um, people want to collaborate more and more. Uh, we're used to listening to, to, to presenters, but these sessions like what the Meeting Support uh, Institute and what the Fresh Conference is about is to make, to, to enhance creativity and you get creativity by collaborating. So we spend quite some time to bring you forward, giving you tools, and at the end of the day it works to, to get all your inputs on screen uh, and to get, have actually much more uh, valuable uh, discussions and, and presentations. Um, so, as a company, we thought of such, uh, such trends or such uh, demands or such uh, needs, and we developed a product uh, about a year ago. It's called Clickshare. Does any one of you have, have any, has anyone of you heard of Clickshare? You have? Great, two. Of course, in the back uh, they have. Uh, I'll move to uh, the device now. What we actually do is um, we create a Wi-Fi in this room by means of a small computer that drives a projector or more projectors. And from then onwards, we can communicate with our, on our own Wi-Fi by means of a button. So this is the ClickShare button. It's a Wi-Fi device and holds software. And I can, instead of taking the cable, I can now hook on my button in the USB of my laptop. And this button will make a connection with my ClickShare Wi-Fi. 
after a few seconds, I'll be able to share what I'm showing on my screen. I'm going to be able to show it on the project. As you see, I'm now uh, connecting to the Wi-Fi in the room. So as soon as this button is not blinking anymore, I'll be able to share it. Is the click share um, presentation on? Okay, there are. So this is the welcome screen of my device that's actually running in the back. This is a demo device. The other one is running in the back. Um, and I'll now um, share my presentation with the group by pushing the button. It takes any resolution, it takes any projector or any screen. So instead of taking a cable, I can now in fact walk around and be on screen and off screen. So that's an easy thing of sharing information. Imagine you come into your boardroom or you want to have collaborative sessions like breakout sessions with, on your event and you want people to bring their laptop or their iPad or an iPhone, you could do so, uh, you could let them present whatever they have or whatever they find on the internet easily on screen. Now, as, as I said, we want to be able to do this as well with other devices and with more than one device. Um, so I can bring up, for example, two images on the same screen. Martin is sitting uh, a bit further. He's on the same network. He has a button. He has a click share button. And by pushing the button, he can be next to my screen. In the end, I can also connect to that same screen via um, my iPad and have a third presentation on screen. So that's where the collaboration really starts. Now, I came in as a third speaker with, my, uh, with this beautiful lady. I can take over the screen by pushing my button for a long time, and I uh, take over actually the, the power of the projector. Now, we, we introduce democracy, so anyone who has a button, he can push the button and take over that screen, like Martin, what he did now. That's in this case from uh, his uh, laptop, okay, yeah. Um, because I don't have a USB device and because I'm, I have an app, I downloaded an app, uh, app for uh, Apple devices, an iOS app, and we also have a Samsung, so an Android app, which I downloaded, and from then on I can share what I have, uh, I can share it on screen. That's a, a Samsung Galaxy, uh, who's on screen as well. So um, this is a product we launched uh, about a year ago. It's invading corporate meeting rooms. We're not as present yet on, on events, but through the Meeting Support Institute, we're trying to see whether we can um, actually find interesting meeting formats, make meeting formats like uh, brainstorms, digital brainstorms, uh, to use the technology at its uh, at its full force. Mm. This is um, the device. Oh, oh, okay, right. Um, this is a device that's now in the market for uh, for one year, uh, and today uh, we're launching worldwide the little uh, sister or brother. Uh, CSM for smaller meeting rooms, so it comes as this with two buttons, and uh, we think it will uh, be very useful too for uh, collaboration rooms, huddle rooms, breakout rooms on your events. Uh, so, I want to be um, listening to your inputs if you have some ideas on how this can enhance your um, your event. Uh, then I'll be great to uh, to hear. Yeah. 1750 euro and the bigger device is uh, 3950 that can drive uh, multiple uh, projectors and screens so that's it as simple as that technology moves fast and we try to do some nice things with it Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, this was clear. Uh, I think it was for, for most of us. It was a new, uh, a new device. I think it's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, and um, 
I, I look forward to see how people will use this uh, and what kind of uh, meeting formats and session formats they will uh, use this. Um, uh, so, Paul, maybe you want to take over no, from, for the questions now? Let's have a quick look of the questions specifically for this presentation. If you want to the oh, price please. point. Yeah. How much uh, first question is a very valid one. Uh, especially on big events, there's Wi-Fi all around. Uh, and you want to have a stable connection. Um, this device runs on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Uh, 2.4 is very heavily used. Uh, 5 gigahertz is much less used. and It's a very stable, um, stable Wi-Fi uh, bandwidth. And uh, that works stable. Of course, it, um, the best is to work with AV rental companies or AV installation companies that uh, can check the Wi-Fi around and install it in a proper way. Um, but, but also, the, the Wi-Fi that you are using is directly from your button to your device, so you're not going over the uh, Wi-Fi that is in this yeah. room, so it's not connected to yeah. the, the venue's Wi-Fi. So it's no, really no, no. your own uh, yeah. Wi-Fi. So I, I come in this room, I plug on, uh, I put power on my device, plug it on my projector, and within a minute I have my own network, my own Wi-Fi, to which I connect with my own buttons. Um, is it possible for the moderator to control? Technically, uh, we can do moderation. We decided, or we choose, however, not to do so. We want to bring democracy in this room, and everyone who wants to share can share. It has its uh, pros and its cons, uh, but we choose to do so to make it actually simple, interactive, easy. Um, in further stages, we could launch some more functionality whereby a moderator could allow certain people or certain moments uh, to share or not to share uh, data. And then the cost question, I think I answered that. Uh, what's the maximum number of connections for, for your basic model? Uh, we can have up to 64 of those uh, click share buttons connected to the base unit. And we can have unlimited uh, number of apps, uh, like uh, mobile devices, connecting to the, to the base unit as well. So we can use it for large, uh, large audiences. Um, <laughs> good advice on 5 gigahertz broadband, but please don't tell too many people. OK. Michael, thank you very much. So we have, we're running out of time, but still we are going to ask for the tables now to work on five minutes for the very last question that you'd like to ask for the panel of speakers. I think we have the opportunity to have great presentations. We've learned a lot. So please, groups, now work. Every, anyone that is outside and wants to participate in the last question, please join the group. There's a group here with just two participants if you can gather here, and you're going now to work together as a group to ask the last question for this great panel of speakers we have here, right? So think about what single question as a group would you like the panel to answer now, right? So five minutes for group discussion. Anyone alone that wants to participate, please join the table. There's seats available here. Our panel is uh, anxiously waiting to answer your most important question. We have Greg is still here. The last is still here. Okay. Well, and these Michael. are the last questions for the panel, but we are running off the time, so perhaps each speaker a question. Do you want to pick one and then? Does any is there any question that any of the speakers wants to answer now? Okay, Alan has an answer to two questions. Well, it's just the, the, on the point of how do you engage the public best when it's something um, they don't want to hear necessarily, and also the technology for the technology's sake. I think in both instances, it's a, it's a matter of, of keeping the content is the king overall. So all the techniques and all the tricks and all the things that you've seen, whether it's the technology or the daft things, some of the daft things I was showing, that the, the content is absolutely everything. And so keeping it short, keeping it relevant, and then keeping it engaging, and, and you know, all those rules apply that we talked about, um, 
but, but overwhelmingly, it's about, for me, it's about the content overrides. And when the content's not something someone wants to hear, and I saw a question about hard, hard seats and soft seats as well, I think the, 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 if the content's interesting and the sessions are short enough, people will listen. Okay, thank you. Greg, is there any question you want to address? I was just going to address the concerns I've heard from quite a few people on the wireless systems that they've had today. And I think it's a mistake to consider that just wireless is wireless. And I think that if wireless and the Wi-Fi is, is truly mission critical to your meeting design from an experience standpoint, you should be asking to the, the provider or the venue to get you bandwidth that can be reserved for your special, uh, uh, your specific purpose. And so it's quite possible to design the bandwidth to uh, reserve a certain percent of the overall pipe to you and your purpose. And so you're not at the overall whim of someone uh, downloading Hulu or some video or YouTube. So again, don't consider the Wi-Fi is not just necessarily just open to everybody. It can be, if you take the time to design the Wi-Fi up front, you can uh, have a much better Wi-Fi experience. Okay, thank you. Good advice. Lars, do you have any, anything you want to address? Okay. I guess that's then the end of our... Okay, so I ask for uh, a round of applause for the tableos and the tables, please, from everybody. Thanks a lot for the tableos for their wonderful job. Great. And... Uh, Thanks for joining us. Thank you for uh, facilitating this as well, Paul. Uh, pleasure, Martin. And s let's wait for the next fresh conference at uh, 1 o'clock. Yes, the next fresh uh, session is going to be about the future of uh, meetings and a uh, lot of interesting uh, perspectives there. So I look forward to see you then. Thank you very much for joining us.